many brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, I welcome you to the 66th class of our in-depth Bible study series. And today we will see how to prepare ourselves for the end of the world and the second coming of the Lord. In our previous class, we saw about the seven prophetic signs in the Bible about the last days. We do not have any doubt that we are in the last days. And looking at the very first sign, we said how our Lord referred to the nation of Israel. Israel is one of the most important areas to know that we are in the end times. You know, our Lord lived just before the end of the Jewish age, at the end of the Jewish period, and he had prophesied about the destruction of Jerusalem. We see that in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, how he gave so many signs about the end of that age, when the temple and the city will be destroyed, and uh, later on, what will happen. In Matthew, we see our Lord gave so many signs, and then he is actually answering two questions there. The question was, when shall these be? That is, when shall the destruction of the temple, stone not being upon stone and all, when that will be? And what are the signs of the end and thy coming? So it referred to the end of the Jewish age, and thereafter our Lord was speaking about the end of the whole world, at which time he has to come back. Well, in Matthew and Luke, if you compare, Jesus first prophesies about the end of the Jewish age, how the temple will be destroyed and how they will be in a great time of trouble and, and they will be dispersed into the world and all that. And then he says, next, what will happen before his coming? So it is as though it is immediately following the signs he gave about the end of the Jewish age. But when we come to Luke, there is a time period between the end of the Jewish age, which Jesus prophesied, and then about the end of the whole world and his coming also. So that we can see in Luke chapter 21. If you compare it to Matthew 24, everything is almost in the same order, except when it comes to the final part. In Matthew, he says, when you shall see the abomination that causes desolation stand in the holy place. But in Luke he says, when you see armies surrounding Jerusalem. So that is self-explanatory. We follow what he said in Luke uh, chapter 21, verse 20 onwards. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation is nigh. And then he says the same as he said in Matthew 24, let them that are in Judea flee to the mountains and uh, all those things. And then about the great tribulation, as is the term used in Matthew 24, here Jesus explains what would happen. And that we read in 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of Gentiles be fulfilled. So this is what our Lord said in Luke. In Matthew, he said, there shall be a great time of trouble such as was not since the beginning of a nation, upon Israel, that is, particularly. And then, of course, later on, other signs are same. As in Matthew 24, there shall be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and uh, upon earth great distress with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the parts of the heaven shall be shaken. All these things are the signs of his coming. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So, brothers and sisters, Jesus is first giving signs about the end of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and later on about the end of the world and his coming. But there is a time period in between and that is what we can see in Luke 21, 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led captive into all nations. This happened in 70 AD as we 
said in the previous class when Titus came and put a siege over Jerusalem for many months and then he stormed the city, destroyed the temple so much so that literally stone upon stone was not left, that was not unturned. And then a million Jews were slaughtered and the rest were taken captives. This was fulfilled in 70 AD. And then he says, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of Gentiles be fulfilled. So there he refers to a time period. Jerusalem will come under the Gentile rule. Or the Gentiles will literally have control over Jerusalem until the times of Gentiles be fulfilled. So until a period of time, Gentiles will occupy the city of Jerusalem and all Judea. So that is the time gap which we can see between the end of the Jewish age and the end of the world itself. So this we followed in our previous class was a long period of time. Now as the times of Gentiles are nearing the end, now there should be a reversal of the situation to the Jews. The Jews were destroyed, they were dispersed, they were without a homeland, they were scattered in all the world for nearly 19 centuries. But then, as the times of Gentiles comes to the close, they should be regathered, re-established in the same place, and they would renew the face of the land and then be established once again as a state. Now, we followed how all this happened since the beginning of 19th century with the Zionist movement, how they began to come under one umbrella under the Zionist movement, and then later on they came back and settled, repopulating the place, and how all this led to the final declaration of the State of Israel in 1948. So about that, Jesus mentions next uh, in a parable. And he said unto them, and he spake to them a parable in verse 29. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. So he's saying, giving us a sign in the fig tree. He said, behold the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, and you see and know of your own selves that summer is nigh at hand. So likewise, ye when you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is near. So this generally refers to all the signs he gave. When you see the signs coming to pass, you know the end is near. But why did he use the fig tree there? Particularly he says fig tree and all the trees. So trees, we know, represent nations. And here the fig tree represents the nation of Israel. We know in prophecy how the two nations of Israel and Judah were compared to two baskets of figs. We know from that that the fig tree represented the nation of Israel to which he came and he expected fruits one day. And since he didn't find any fruit in it, he had cursed that so much that it literally withered from the roots. Now that tree has to be replanted there and then it is to shoot forth leaves and again flourish. So that was a very, very important sign which is getting fulfilled in our generation since 1948. And interestingly, what our Lord says here, he is in verse 32, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. So the generation which sees the fig tree coming back to sprouting again and flourishing again, in that generation only the Son of Man will come back. So very clearly we know that we are in the last days. In our lifetime, our Lord has to come. There are so many other signs which we saw in our previous class, which if you had missed, you please check it in our playlist. We saw seven signs that we are in the last days. Now, what should we do? Knowing that the end is very close, we as Christians, what are we supposed to do? How should we live? 
how should we prepare ourselves for the end and for the coming of our lord because for us the end of the world also means us seeing our lord so how do we prepare ourselves that is what we will see today and that our lord gives us the admonition in the following verses of the same chapter in verse 34 we see it and take heed to yourself lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life so that that day come upon you unawares so what our lord is saying is take heed to yourself so since we know that the end is near since we see all these signs what should we do our lord says take heed to yourself now the same thing he says in verse 36 watch ye thereof so you have to watch be watchful you have to take heed take precaution take heed to yourselves so that is what our lord very clearly says here so that that day will not come upon you unawares means if you don't take heed then it will come upon us unaware means suddenly as it comes upon the rest of the world see in verse 35 for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth so upon the whole earth it will come suddenly like a trap unexpectedly they will get caught in this snare so if you don't want to be like the world then you have to take heed be watchful that is what uh, he very clearly says so apostle paul also in first thessalonians chapter 5 1 to 3 he tells us how that it will not come upon us suddenly as it comes upon the world if we are watchful so we see that in first thessalonians chapter 5 1 to 3 but of the times and seasons i need not write unto you brethren for yourself know perfectly that the day of the lord so cometh as a thief in the night so about the times and seasons he says the day of the lord will come as a thief in the night means when people are sleeping when they are, are not expecting the thief to come at that time the thief will come so he says that but in verse 3 he says for when they shall say peace and safety then sudden destruction cometh on them as travel upon a woman with child and they shall not escape so when they shall say peace and safety so when all is going on and people are talking about prosperity and that's how the world is the world is always expecting better times to come peaceful days days in which they can live happily they can enjoy life that is what the world is expecting and in fact the majority of the christians are also are influenced by these false preachers who preach prosperity gospel that is what they promise many christians god will bless you god will heal you god will save you from all your troubles god will cause your income to grow rapidly you god the father will bless you in worldly things and god of job will give you double and so on they all preach and make the people go after peace and safety that is what they expect and that is what they expect from god and they think that is the blessing that they can expect but verse 4 he says but ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief so upon the whole world and upon ignorant people it will come as a thief in the night but it will not come it will not overtake you as a thief he says why you are all children of light and the children of the day we are not of the night nor of darkness so he says we are the children of the day we are not of the night so children of the day means the millennium day we are hoping and waiting for that great day to come and he says we are not children of darkness now 
Here, night means sinfulness and darkness means ignorance. Now the world is sinful, disobedient and the world is in darkness. They are ignorant. Ignorant of God, ignorant of God's ways, ignorant of the coming day of Christ, a thousand year day and all that they are ignorant of. Therefore, it will not overtake you as a thief, he says. And then verse 6, Therefore, let us not sleep in the night as to others, but let us watch and be sober. So, it will not come upon us as a thief if we are sober and if we are watch. So, we need to watch, take heed. Otherwise, it will come as a thief. Verse 7, for they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken, are drunken in the night. So as our Lord said in uh, Luke uh, 21, 34, take heed to yourself, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness. So surfeiting means overindulging. It could be food or it could be anything in which we are so involved that we are unmindful of other things. So, drunkenness also, it is of course primarily the effect of alcohol. Those who overeat and drink, they are dull, they become dull. You know, when we eat too much, sometimes we go to all-you-can-eat restaurants or to some parties, if we eat heavily, then you become dull, you feel like sleeping. You are not alert, you are not in a position to think properly because we are under the influence of food and our hearts become overcharged. You know, it becomes burdened, it becomes dull. And so also, if you drink, if a person drinks, he is under the influence of that substance and alcohol or could be drugs, so that he is in a separate world. He is not alert, he is not in a position to watch himself or the watch the world, the events of the world. So, also, drunkenness and surfeiting could be other than food also. Some are drunk with alcohol, some are so drunk with sports. You know, they are so much into sports, they are always glued to their TVs, following all the games, hours together, whole days, they are so connected to that sport that they won't mind anything else but that. And some are drunk with music, always they are listening to music, they are being influenced by music, they follow all the popular musicians and they are drunk by music and some by entertainment, drunkenness of watching soap operas or serials as we say or movies it could be or short videos or so many things they could be obsessed with drunken with entertainment or some are drunken with business they are under the influence of business they are so much into business always trying to do things improve things make money some are so influenced like they are like drunk people, they are total after money. Whatever they do, they do it for money. It's always money is the first thing in their life. Or as Jesus says, cares of this world. There are so many things they want to do. It could be family also. They could be so totally entangled with family that they are like drunken people, they are not sober, they are not watching the signs, they are not watching their spiritual life. It can be. That's why the Lord said, unless you love me more than children, more than wife, more than yourself, you cannot follow me. So even children or even grandchildren, like my sister, she has a grandchild. She is so much with her, always taking care of her, always 24 hours with her. That. She does not have time even to talk with us for two minutes or so. Even if we call, you know, she'll just talk and suddenly she'll say, oh, I have to go, I have to take care of her, I have to do this for her, I have to do that thing for her. So she has, now that, that uh, child is growing and, and she has fixed her time. So, so much time I have to make her ready and then 
I have to drop her to play home, and then I have to pick her up. So in that time, don't call me. So she's totally busy with that grandchild. So like this, there are so many things we can get entangled. Another time, I saw one brother. After a long time, he came home and I, said, and I asked him, "How is your Bible study going? And what are you studying in particular right now?" He said, "I can't even read Bible. I never." read Bible also. Why? Because he says, whenever I open my Bible, my third son will come and close it, the Bible. He's so small, he will not let me read. He will tear the pages or he will ask me to close the Bible and I can't read Bible also. See the state in which he is. He can't even read Bible because of his son. And the same person, he was talking to me about building house and and raising money for that. And in fact, he asked me for a big loan also. So, you see, he has got entangled. In, in his mind, all his time goes into family, into building houses and how to raise money for that. So much so that he's like a person who is under the influence of drinks, like he's drunken with the worldly spirit. So, brothers and sisters, if we are like this, then we will become like those of the night and in darkness so that that day will come upon us unawares. But let us who are of the day be sober, he says. And then he says, let us put on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet the hope of salvation. Verse 8. So here he is saying, let us who are of the day be sober means be alert, not under the influence of anything. Food also, we should be careful about food, about what we drink and what controls our minds and hearts. So that's what here he says, he mentions about the breastplate of faith and love. So breastplate, we know, protects our heart. You see, see, here he says, faith and love is like breastplate. We have to protect our interest. We have to take heed of, of our heart, its affections, its desires. If we give our heart to money or to family, so much so or to anybody, so much so that our hearts become overcharged or burdened with all these cares of this world, with all these other affections, so much so that the end will come upon us suddenly. So we have to protect our interests, our desires, our hearts. And then he says, for an helmet you take the hope of salvation. So helmet also here we have to wear, he says. So helmet is the hope of salvation, our hope, the strong hope we have, the wonderful hope we have that Jesus will come, change us, and that we will rule with him for a thousand years. He will take us to heaven and he will establish his kingdom on earth. That is the hope. So here all these three things are mentioned. You see faith and breastplate of faith and love and the hope of salvation. And these three things are what is most important we know in First Corinthians chapter 13 verse 13 in which he says these three things abide. Faith, hope and love of which love is the greatest. So all these things, faith, we should protect our faith, we should have faith like a breastplate, we should have love like a breastplate, means we should protect our hearts and helmet protects our mind. So two important things, our hearts and minds, our affections, our desires, and then our thinking, our mind, our thought life, both should be protected. We should not allow our hearts be burdened with all the cares of this world, the love of this world, the love of things and all. And we should see that our minds are not distracted from the main thing that is the end of the world and the coming of the Lord. So hearts and minds we should watch, he says. And so Lord continues to in Luke 21:36. Watch you therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So here our Lord says, watch ye 
and pray always. So we need to be alert and we need to be prayerful always. Always ask the Lord to protect us, to help us to remain faithful, to help us to fight these distractions that come upon us, to keep us from the deceptions of Satan. That's also another important thing. As we see, one of the signs of the last days is deception. Christians are being deceived. So in order to protect our minds, we need to wear the helmet. In order to protect our righteousness, we need to wear the breastplate. So we need to pray. As we read in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 8, he says, Be anxious in nothing. That is something we should all learn. We should not be anxious when we know about the end of this world and about how dangerous the days are and all that. We should not be anxious. So he says, be anxious in nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So we should not be anxious in anything. So he says, be anxious in nothing, but in everything you pray. So nothing sh should cause us to be panicking or worried. And then in everything, we need to, by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. It's not only prayer. It is supplication means praying for others. And we should always be thankful for our answered prayers. God has answered our prayers so many times. So we should be thankful for that. We should pray for others and we should pray for ourselves. And then he says, let your request be made known unto God. So whatever it is that has happened, let us not be anxious or worried about it. Let us come to God and make our request to God. Let us leave it at the hand of God. God will do what is best for us. God will help us. So God will take care of it. So let us come and hand it over to God and stop worrying about it. What God's will is, let that be done. So that is what uh, our Lord says, uh, we should watch and pray always. And verse 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ. So again he mentions about hearts and minds. There in Thessalonians, Paul said, wear the breastplate of faith and love and then for a helmet, the hope of salvation. So there also heart needs to be protected and the mind should be protected. Here he says, the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So, brothers and sisters, that is what we should be doing. Be watchful and be prayerful to protect our heart, to protect our mind. And in Luke 21, 36, he says, Watch and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Here again, our Lord says, Watch and pray that you may be accounted worthy. He says, you need to become worthy to escape all these things. All the end, the destruction that is prophesied is about to come upon us. If we need to escape all that, and also we need to be worthy enough to stand before the Son of Man. So the end is going to come, and our Lord is also going to come, so we are not only to be worthy so that we can escape the destruction, but also thereafter to be able to stand before the Son of God. So such is the requirement upon us. So in order to be that, we need to be so watchful and prayerful. Brothers and sisters, now God has said he will destroy the whole world. This world is reserved unto fire. Just as Lord destroyed the whole world, 
in a flood in Noah's day, God is about to destroy this whole world. Why? Because of their ungodliness, their ungodly ways. As we see in Jude, Enoch repeatedly uses that word. God is coming, he says, in verse 14, and Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of this saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. How many times the word ungodly is used here? So God is going to come to punish them because of their ungodliness. If he is going to destroy the whole world, and if he has to save you, if you have to escape all this destruction, then you have to be worthy of that, isn't it? Just like Noah, you see. God destroyed the whole world, saved Noah. But what type of person in Noah was? Noah was believer. He believed in God's word. Noah was obedient to God's word. He not only had faith in what God said when God said he was about to destroy the world. He believed that, but he put that faith in action by building the ark to save himself and his family. He built it for 120 years. He put that faith in action. He did all that God asked him to do in obedience. And that is what saved him. And therefore, we need to believe in the prophecies. And also we need to put that in action. We need to build our life. We have to do things to keep our hearts and minds holy and worthy. We have to become worthy as Noah. See, Noah was not only a righteous man as we know in uh, Genesis chapter 6. Uh, it says he was a righteous man. Just man it says. Verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Verse 9, these are the generation of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. He was a just man. He was a righteous man. But also we read in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 5, verse 5, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, and bringing in the flood upon the world of ungodly. So when he brought the flood upon all ungodly people, ungodly people, he saved Noah because he was just man and preacher of righteousness. He also used to do preaching. As when he wa was building this ark for 120 years, people would come and ask him, why are you building this ark? He would say, God will destroy this world. Rain is going to come. Or God has asked me to build this to save myself. So he began to preach righteousness. Why? Because the people are sinful. So. If we continue in a sin, God will bring destruction. So you began to witness also. So if God saved Noah because he was obedient and just, we need to be just and obedient. If God is destroying the world and we are like the worldly people, we are also doing the same things as the world is doing, how can we expect God to save us? Because with God there is no partiality. If we are doing the very same thing as the people of the world, then how can we expect to be saved? Because God did not leave even the angels who sinned. See in verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Even angels God did not spare. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah. Whole world. You know what's this? So many women and children and infants were there. God did not spare any one of them. Entire families were wiped out by the flood. If the same God has to save you, you need to be worthy. That's what Jesus said. Watch ye and pray that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things. Worthy like Noah to believe God and to be obedient to him. And also after the flood we know what happened. Again the world began to be repopulated and Noah and Lot was there. Lot went to Sodom and Gomorrah. 
And we know Sodom and Gomorrah, the people were very sinful, very adulterous and fornicators and homosexuals, but Lot lived among them. And God sent his angels to destroy those cities, but he saved Lot. Only Lot is saved. All other cities with all the people, God destroyed by raining fire and brimstone upon them. He saved Lot. But Lot, he was a righteous man. He was worthy to be saved, isn't it? He feared God. And he hated these unrighteous things that people did. That's what we read here in verse 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. So he destroyed these cities and made it as an example of what he will do with ungodly people later on. So it is just a model how the whole world will be destroyed by fire as we read in 2 Peter 3, 7. God demonstrated that when he destroyed the cities of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, verse 7, and delivered just Lot. You see, Lot was a just man, vexed with filthy conversation of the wicked. He was vexed because of the lifestyle of the people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 8, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. You see, he was not very comfortable in Sodom and Gomorrah. He was not at home in Sodom and Gomorrah. He vexed his righteous soul upon seeing all the things they were doing and their ungodly ways. It vexed him so much. It made him so uncomfortable. So, brothers and sisters, that is how we are in these days. The world is like Sodom and Gomorrah today, isn't it? Mainly, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were fornicators. They had gone after strange flesh. Not only were they living unholy sexual life, but they had started homosexuality, lesbianism, women with women, men with men, and all these things were the reason God destroyed them, you see. And then in verse 9 he says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver godly out of temptation, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of to be punished, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. So especially those who are sexually immoral, unclean, God will bring judgment upon them. And God saved Lot there. Why? Because he was vexed with all the things. So how are we today? We are also living amid some ungodly people. And when we look at them, the things that they do, do we feel like getting vomit? That's how we should feel should be vexed with what all the things that is happening. Or are we okay with it? Are we getting along with it? Or are we even being entertained by the world? The things of this world. So if we like it, if it's okay for us, if the people of the world, what all they do is okay for us, then we have become like them only. So how can we expect God to save us when he is about to destroy the world? Because we are also like the worldly people. But if we are righteous, we will be disgusted with all the things that is going on. The way the people live, as we said, one of the signs is moral degradation. How degraded people are. The way the people dress. The way the people shamelessly do so many things. Since this coming of this WhatsApp and Facebook and videos and all that, if someone, one heroine, celebrity does something, everybody is repeating that. You see, in India, uh, some catchy music and songs, it's some vulgar dance. Now, everybody is doing, all the girls and women are also doing that. And the way they they, they dress also nowadays. In our Indian culture, we wear fully. No, sari, that is what we are used to, or in the 
uh, Northern said the silver kameez, it will cover everything. So much cloth. That is what we are used to. But over the years, people are changing so much. First they used to say it is only the Christians who wear skirt and western dresses and all that, pants and skirt and all that. It was kind of a, you know, remark on Christians. They dress, they don't dress properly and all that. But nowadays, even the Hindus or Muslims or all people in India, girls are dressing like that. They're wearing mini skirts and so much exposure and, and they are so bold and everybody is doing that. So, in, when we see that, uh, all around us when things are going out like that, how do we feel for that? So brothers and sisters, uh, the world, we know, is going to be destroyed and if God should save us, we need to be worthy. That's what Jesus says. Uh, and then he says, not only to be worthy to escape all these things that come upon this world in verse 36 and to stand before the Son of Man. We should be worthy to stand before Him. Now are we worthy to stand before Him? So if we need to be worthy to stand before Him, if we can stand before the righteous Lord who loves righteousness, then we need to be righteous. We cannot be with the people of the world. We cannot do just like the people of the world. If we are like that, we will also be punished along with them. If we are to be able to stand before him, we cannot walk with the world. That's what in Psalms chapter 1 we clearly read. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. We should not walk according to the worldly people's ways. Nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of scornful. So there is talking about walking with the ungodly, or standing in the way of sinners, or sitting in the seat of the scornful. Those scornful means those who deny the existence of God, those who do not fear God, those who even go to the extent of mocking God or God's words. If we are also sitting with them, if we are standing in the way of sinners, or if you are walking with the ungodly, how can we hope to stand before the Son of Man? So here it's talking about walking and then standing and then sitting. It's like some worldly program is going on on TV. As we are walking about here and there, we just have a glimpse like that. And then we stand for some time and stand and watch. And then we sit comfortably and <laughs> totally get along with that. So these are the different stages. And we just we just passing look, it could be, it could be just a harmless glance. And then just talk for a moment and then start appreciating it or enjoying it. And then sit and totally become one with it. So if we are that, like that, uh, you see, we are not to be blessed. So he says, Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. See, you should delight in the law of the Lord. So that's another important thing. Along with prayer, we need to watch means watch means watch the word of God. Not watch some sports show, cricket or football match. We need to watch the word. Meditate upon the word. Delight. You see, his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's what some many Christians are. In our church we see people come and sit and listen to God's word. They delight to hear God's word. Though the messages are so long, sometimes it goes beyond one hour and one and a half hour, sometimes even two hours. They are not uncomfortable sitting for that long also. At the stretch, because they delight to hear. They love to hear God's word. The more deeper it is, the more they enjoy. They delight and Apart from sitting in the church and listening to an hour-long sermon, 
they go home and again watch it on youtube they watch the video again in different languages also that shows they delight in the word of the lord rather they one of our sisters uh, a new interest you know they happened to see our video and she sent a voice message in which so, so many times she repeatedly says how happy she is to hear all the messages how that she delights to hear this preaching again and again she repeats that word that shows that she delights in god's law god's word that's how we should be and verse three and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water bringing forth his fruit in season his leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doth shall prosper he will become like a tree which is planted next to water so if you are always meditating in god's word night and day we start he says growing to be a tree which gives fruit now oh, brothers and sisters that's what we should do we should bring forth fruits god wants us to give fruits even our lord in his uh, parable he mentions about a noble man who went into the far country in luke 9 verse 11 to 27 he says a noble man went into a far country he before that he called his servants and gave them all this talent and he said occupy till i come so do business with my money and then when he came back he called his servants and asked them to give account to him what you did and there one talent i made it double and other person says i made it four times more and he rewards them and then one person comes i buried it in mud he says so our lord is saved us given us this knowledge of truth he is hearing our prayer he has given us the holy spirit forgiven all our sins and protecting us and all his grace he has given us and he expects fruits in return the fruits of the spirit the fruit of love joy peace and patience and all these things good characters he wants us to produce fruit and also he wants us to use this and multiply that if he saved us we have to go and save others isn't it we have to go and bring others into the fold or help in that ministry so that is what he says you know we need to be fruitful when the lord comes if we should be able to stand before him then we should have done something for him with what he did for us and he will ask account then what if we say oh lord with all the grace and mercy you gave me i was able to build a big house for myself i gave very good education for my children i made lot of money i bought this car i bought that this and that and all that can we say that all that is for ourselves we did we built houses for ourselves for our children but what did we do for him with all the grace and mercy we received from him what did we do for him for his glory for his kingdom that is what we should be able to answer so we need to be worthy to stand before him and to answer him to give account of ourselves uh, to him but the ungodly how are they in verse 4 the ungodly are not so means the ungodly are not like the trees but how are they but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away the people of the world they are just like chaff you see the wind will blow them away they will vanish they are there here today having great names and followers and and lot of money and they look like they are flourishing big tree but they are actually like chaff which w- the coming fire will destroy them and remove them forever therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment so the ungodly will not be able to stand before him so if we are also ungodly how can we expect to stand before him therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous so we are not righteous by christ's help by prayer and being watchful 
and by his grace if we are still following ungodly ways and becoming ungodly like the world we cannot stand in the judgment or in the congregation of the righteous for the lord know what the way of the righteous but the way of the ungodly shall perish so we too will perish if we are ungodly so our lord said watch ye and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that come upon the earth and to be able to stand before the son of man so brothers and sisters how important that we check our ways how much prayer is required how much meditating in god's word is required and all that we need to do in order to be righteous before him in hebrews chapter 12 verses 14 and 15 we know follow holiness without holiness no one shall see the lord we cannot even see the lord let alone being able to stand before him and talk to him you see without holiness we cannot even see him means how important it is uh, brothers and sisters and in romans chapter 13 he gives us very good admonition as to how what we should do being in the last days in romans 13 chapter 11 to 14 and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed so he is saying this prophetically not that the day was closer at his time but he is speaking prophetically of those who are living in this last days he says now is our salvation nearer than we believed because we see the signs what paul said what jesus said all before us we know it is so nearer and he says it is high time to awake out of sleep to so not awake out of sleep means sleep means worldliness you see sleeping spiritually sleeping regarding the things of god we are sleeping Be, that means being active in the world very active in worldly affairs the cares of this world and pleasures of this world so that spiritually we are gone into sleep like the world as the children of the night and as children of darkness doing dark things sinful things that is what he says so he says whatever we did in the past it is gone but now we should awake now the time to awake like when the lord's coming was delayed you know in the parable of the 10 virgins all of them slept all of them wise and foolish all slept maybe we also slept but when the midnight we heard the call of his coming these are the signs you know war breaking out in israel is like a wake up call for us when we heard that voice we have to get up and the wise virgins streamed their lamps and had oil which they had carried and they were about to went out to face the lord but the other five were foolish because they did not carry this extra oil in their vessel means in their heart when the oil was available when preaching was everywhere available when churches were available and bibles were available they didn't make time to read they didn't make time to fill their minds with the spirit of god so that that when the last moment come at that time it was not possible because when the situation is about to change drastically in the very end at that time where is the time to sit and study where is the time to grow in the lord where is the time to prove our holiness and faithfulness to god because at that time the bombs will be falling everywhere there will be hardly food or water then where is the time to prepare in a spiritual way so this is the time we need to prepare earlier god is warning us so that we may have enough time to gather the oil so also He says in verse 12, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us thereof cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. The night is far spent, means the 6,000 years of sin, right from the time Adam and Eve sinned. It has been a night of ignorance and disobedience and curse and God's wrath upon the world. You see, the curse has been like weeping, and sorrow all along but then it is almost past 
and day is at hand the millennium day the day in which the sun of righteousness will arise with healing on his wings it is so much at hand let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light so again he sp- speaks about l- armor here so let us cast off the works of darkness sinful things the things of the world things that are displeasing to god let us let it also become disgusting to us the ways of the world let us put it off and then put on the armor of light the breastplate and then the helmet and then we know the girdle of truth and then the sword of the word of god then shoes of preaching the gospel and then of course we should do prayer all prayer with all supplications all this we have to put on the armor of light verse 13 let us walk honestly as in the day not in writing and drunkenness not in chambering and wantonness not in strife and in way now he, he mentioned strife and in way along with drunkenness and actual immorality so because even strife means getting into quarrel with somebody and hating somebody and being jealous and all these things are also things that will cause our heart to be burdened so much so that it will distract us from the goal so brothers and sisters uh, he says let us walk honestly let us be honest with ourselves before with let us be honest before god let us not try to deceive god and deceive ourselves no many try to just to be have a form of godliness that's one of the signs of the last days people will have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof so what is the use they are not honest they say they are christians they are but they are not following christ word they do not obey christ word they say they are holy but only when they come to church they look holy but when they go out they are like the world they mix with the world they big mingle with the world they are worldly friends and they are all becoming ungodly behaving in every ungodly way having the love of money and business is more important than god to them and they don't delight in god's word so what is the use they just pretend to be holy what is the use they pretend to be god if that is the case god will also pretend to save us but he will not save us i've seen this in my experience brothers and sisters those who are just have a form of godliness you know god will really not save them god will give them time to repent but if they continue in that way they can't hope to be saved i've seen god just forsakes them you know like if we pretend to be holy god will pretend to save us because we read in in the scriptures to the forward he will be forward to the holy he will be holy right so let us walk honestly as in the day not in writing and drunkenness partying enjoying you see putting loud music and dancing you see this is what is very popular these days among not only young people but even old people not in writing and drunkenness or chambering and wantonness chambering means secret things people do that in private all these lustful things uh, wantonness means they continually are lustful they are never satisfied they go beyond the boundaries so much so they indulge themselves into all these activities so let us not do that he says but put you on the lord jesus christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof so the lust is so strong it wants more and more you see it's so selfish it's not satisfied with anything so instead of making provision for the flesh making things to satisfy our flesh let us deny ourselves let us take up the cross because the time is short let us meditate on god's word day and night let us give our private hours to prayer and to preach the word of righteousness and in by doing all these things we will save 
ourselves to be become worthy to escape all these things and to be able to stand before the son of man and finally we just look up at first corinthians chapter 7 verses 29 to 31 it's very very important what he says we should do in the last days uh, in first corinthians chapter 7 verses 29 to 31 But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it for the fashion or the form or the nature of this world is passing away. So he says, the world as we know it, this world along with its fashion, the way of this world, everything is passing away. The time is short for that to happen. You see, we see, I say, brethren, the time is short. So time is short means, generally our time on earth is very short. Our life itself is short, isn't it? so soon we become young and uh, up to 25 years we are growing childhood and youthful and teenage age and studying and then we finish our degree and by that time we become 25 now it's passes so fast and so soon we get married also and then we have children bringing up children and so soon the children will become older like 25 then we become 50 and then when our children have children we become grandparents that's it just 25 25 25 how fast it goes how fast it goes and before we know it we are our life itself will be ended life is short that's what people say life is short make it sweet they say enjoy it they say but since life is short why not consecrate it sacrifice it for god so that we may get everlasting life isn't it brothers and sisters life is short as it is but then if we are in the last days it is even more shortened you <laughs> see it becomes even more shorter because we don't know if we will live up to 75 also is it 25 25 25 where we have the hope of living up to 75 the world as we see according to the science may not go beyond 10 years because based on the chronology as we saw in our last class We have clear indication that by 2034 or 37, by that time in 10 or 12 years, everything may end. Means actually end, I mean. But before that, the process of ending would, would have already started. Now already it has started in for the people of Gaza and people of Ukraine and and so many other countries. Wars are going on and situation is so bad there. so much so they don't have proper food also in africa and so many other countries they don't have pr- water also drinking water also no it will become worse and worse even it will come to places like india also more and more unemployment and what if some war breaks out here also no it will break out as we saw in our last class it like a whirlwind that has started in middle east it will go on go on until the ends of the world so even the short time more and more it will become difficult as we go by so he says since that time is short it remaineth that both they that have wives as though they had none this talking about uh, remarrying after uh, the wife leaves or dies and all that talking to widowers and widows and all that but then he says whatever it is since the time is short let them that have wives be as though they had none no what does that mean as though i don't have wife means not that i'm free to roam about uh, like a bachelor and enjoy life no even if i have a wife i'm blessed with a wife don't focus everything on that don't just put all your heart on that why because jesus said you have to love me more than your wife and children not only that but this earthly relationship you know husband and wife or 
parents and children and siblings all this is temporary only our relationship with god is eternal because once we die and then we are resurrected in god's kingdom there is no more marriage there is no more this relationship isn't it we all will have the memory of our relationship of course we will love one another but this relationship is not eternal so don't dwell upon this as though it is everything you know god has blessed you with a wife okay be thankful but don't think everything is that only because you may lose her maybe she may die or he may die or maybe they are unfaithful and leave and go also all that is happening but don't dwell on that that's why he says those that have wives be as though they had none and they that weep as though they weep not you see in some cases you know relationship will not turn out good and you know breakups will happen divorce will happen so then he says if you are weeping if you are sorrowful as though you are weeping not don't dwell too much on that you know it happens that sometimes when we are disappointed we are so in so engrossed in that all that we think of is that only but paul says do weep as though you weep not don't think don't weep so much and then he says they that rejoice as though they rejoice not and they as though they rejoice not. even you have something to rejoice don't dwell too much on that you rejoice in your children's education or achievements or worldly possession or he says they that buy as though they possessed not you buy something you bought a house or bought a car don't dwell too much on that ha- happiness as our lord said where your treasure is there your heart will be so let not these things become the treasure so that your heart is on them only you know, wife or children or what possessions because all these things are temporary it will go off it is only for a short time you know my mother she is 84 years old now uh, she is weak now she cannot go about as she used to or has no pleasure even in eating also so there is that realization that it's coming to an end and and that's what she was telling to me other day we care so much for things of this world about houses and possessions and all this but in the end we have to just leave everything and go nothing will benefit us nothing will profit us so she was telling me that so like that brothers and sisters all these things are temporary as long as we live now it doesn't matter how we are now whether we are rejoicing whether we are wife or whether we are single because everything is going to end <laughs> once everything ends it doesn't matter how our life went what matters is whether we are worthy before god isn't it so he says they that use the world as not abusing it means we use the world we use so many things in this world we use the latest technology we use our smartphones we use whatsapp we use facebook we use this youtube or all these things but we should see that we do not abuse it we can use it in the right way you can we can use it to promote god's word or truth and encourage one another i use whatsapp i use facebook but at the same time we should be careful we do not abuse it as the world in general they do isn't it there's so many things that are just satisfying our lust if you are after sports there is so much in that if you are after movies there's endless amount of movies and all these things are becoming free you know easily accessible but then at the same time we can use it properly also so many useful things so many things we can use to get knowledge you know many people in a church ask now how you are able to gain so much knowledge and how you are able to preach so well i say whenever i have time i keep on gaining knowledge we can read endless number of books online we can see things you know people have brought about so many useful things we can get that knowledge so those that use the world as not abusing it and he says for the fashion of this world passeth away the world as we know it is passing away it's not going to be any more 
as we read in first john the three things in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes the lust the pride of life all these things are of the world and not of the father for this world will pass away and the world thereof but they that do the will of god will abide forever that is what we have to focus on so when i will tell you a small anecdote brothers and sisters imagine we want to leave this country our country whatever country we are <laughs> say we are in a third world country and go to a very better place okay maybe sweden or denmark or, or new zealand or some other good place and we try for the visa we make ready the passport and we arrange the money for that and we do so many things in order to be able to go and settle there so after doing all that finally the time approaches the day approaches how we prepare for that then how we look forward for it how we are willing to leave all these things in the present country all the entanglements and we are finally able to fly off now finally the day will come and that we have booked our tickets and we have that timing is there and imagine we are traveling from a certain distance we have to come to the main city by car or <laughs> some way you know how we will do that our one goal will be to reach the airport to board the airplane and to fly off isn't it so as we are traveling to the airport we will not let ourselves get diverted you know we will not look at a theater oh that's a very good show let me watch that uh, movie and go do we do that or 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 do we say oh let me go and visit such a person and spend some time there with them and go no or perhaps we see an all you can eat restaurant and do we stop and go there and eat ourselves so much so that we have a stomach <laughs> upset and have to get admitted and all that no we are afraid of that we don't want to get sick so as to miss the flight or if we are on the way and if there is some accident or small accident and we get into a fight you know somebody tries to quarrel with us do we indulge in that quarrel and start fighting over the trifle matter and go to police station or uh, and uh, get held up there and all that no we just want to get rid of all this distraction we just want to go ahead and reach the airport and catch a flight isn't it that is how now we must see the end of this world and our lords coming brothers and sisters all these years we waited we consecrated our life we spent hours and hours studying to know the god's will and we went to church so many services we attended so many meetings we did and all this in order to go to heaven with our lord when he comes now when his coming is closer how can we afford to miss that how can we afford to become negligent about that how can we continue to sleep in worldliness the time is short this now is the time to awake now we should not let ourselves get entangled into anything or to get distracted into anything because none of these things are worth missing our flight to heaven our lord is taking us to heaven itself and that is eternal now how can we get involved in anything whether it be relationships or whether it be any lustful things that things that we desire or jealousies or envies or pride or pride of this world cares of this world nothing is worth missing our trip to heaven so brothers and sisters let us be of that mindset let us have that urgency now the time has come so let us live as children of day put on the armor of light pray always watch watch our own characters our own behavior watch the word of god watch the situation in the world for the signs let us be fruitful let us be busy with the lord's work because we need to give account to him and let us look forward 
with great hope brothers and sisters though the things are going to become very gloomy by and by yet the day the millennial day is so wonderful and we let us have this hope and live for that day may god help you and me to be able to be worthy to escape all the things that is coming on the world and to be able to stand before the son of man god bless this words mm-hmm.